Hey guys, it's Mr. Rich. Uh, right now, I'm at home, probably snuggled up to my little boy who's not feeling so great. Um, but anyway, I've got a lecture for you, and it's on the Great Schism, which I think some of you remember quite well. I think I recall Miss Linder saying that it was perhaps the best grade she received in lower school. So glad to bring up such fond memories for all of you at the expense of Mother Church. Anyway, um, no, but in all seriousness, I do want to say a thing or two about tonight's reading. Um, I have finished it uh, this weekend and just found it remarkable. It's such an interesting thing. Uh, you're going to read about this guy's life, Bernard of Clairvaux, before you read his work on loving God, and I just hope you can, I just want to encourage you to keep an open mind. Uh, he is medieval. He is very Catholic, and uh, you know, so he's going to have beliefs that you don't. Um, he is going to have done things that you might not approve of. But when you read on loving God, I hope you kind of get the sense that even across the ages, across hundreds of years, and across a lot of theological division, there is some similarity between the two of you. I, you will find it challenging. I mean, it's just academically and intellectually going to be a challenging read. There's no t question about that. But um, I think if you work hard enough and, and you try to understand what you're looking at, there is some really edifying stuff in what he's going to say. Anyway, I'm looking forward to kind of discussing it with you. That's probably what we're we'll doing a lot of this week. Um, so read that tonight. Read carefully. There's a lot of study guide questions for you to answer. Uh, they're designed, of course, to get you thinking, not just for you to jot down uh, quick answers to have completed it. So put some put a little energy into those at least. I'm not looking for essays, but... Uh, Use your brain. Use your brain, then use your pen a little bit too. All right. Well, this picture here, you got um, this is a pretty interesting picture. This is the uh, current current or almost current uh, patriarch of Constantinople sitting right next to uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who preceded Francis. Um, and this is this, these two guys were together. Uh, in this case, at the installation of Pope Francis. And so this is a sign to show you that the relationship between Rome and Constantinople um, is, um, you know, of course, today in Istanbul, but um, the, the relationship with West and East is something that is still in focus, still something that both uh, Rome, the Roman Pope, and the Eastern Patriarch are trying to deal with. Well, it all goes back to 1054. So let's talk about some of the key figures that are involved here. The first one is a German king named Henry III. He is a member of the Salian dynasty. Now, the Salian dynasty is the dynasty that comes after Otto the Great and all the Renaissance. So this is like Otto's great-great-grandchildren have already been on the throne and died, and power has shifted from his family to the Salian family. And it was another instance in which you know, the, the German nobles elected this, this family and began the dynasty essentially by kind of a vote. Um, and Henry the uh, Third takes over, and he he is uh, known as one of the Holy Roman Empire emperors, and he's also known as the Pious, sometimes called the Pious. And he had a heart for reform, and he was known for a seer, seer, sincere faith. Now, in 1046, he heads down to Rome to kind of get his official commission as the HRE. But when he gets there, what he finds is like a big slugfest going on between three bishops, all of whom want to be the next pope. And this disturbs him deeply. So he decides that, you know, because he can obviously see these guys are fighting for power and money and all the wrong things. So he decides to get one of his own guys and put him on the throne. He does. He goes to find a German pope and he puts one on the throne. That German pope dies. And then he gets another one. He puts him on the throne and another pope dies and it's like two in a row you can imagine how disheartened he would be and then he finds this fella leo the ninth uh leo the ninth becomes uh pope in 1048 a.d stays there for six years and works his tail off uh bringing about reform to the catholic church under the reign of henry the third now how did a uh, guy who was so concerned for reform and in a day and age when the king and pope were trying so hard to do the right thing, how did 
the East and the West kind of undergo this major uh, split that has not been healed in a, almost a thousand years. Well, it has to do with some theological problems that had already come on in the background, of course. Now, remember, every one of these theological problems has also got personal pro personality problems, uh, political problems. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going into the mix here, but we'll use the theological problems kind of as a uh, tab, you know, as we go through. So first one is monothelitism. Uh, monothelitism is basic doctrine that Christ has two natures, but one will. This was supported in the East, but not in the West. And things got quite ugly uh, during this controversy. And to the point that, you know, people that were holding the wrong view in the wrong place could be physically punished for what they were doing. Now, this is a long time ago. Don't get it. Don't get me wrong. It's, you know, 600s AD. But it's the sort of thing that lasted. It held on. And it set up a pretty deep divide between East and West. Um, and it's, of course, hard for us to understand why this issue posed such a problem. Um, and I'll be honest, it's hard sometimes for me to get my head around. But um, it's ultimately going to lead to what's called the filioque uh, controversy, where um, a whole clause gets added to the Nicene Creed. And uh, just to kind of set you up for that connection, which I'm going to cover here in a minute, let me say this. Monothelitism, okay, which is supported in the East, means that Christ has his own will. So think of it as like one will. He has his own will. He's got two natures. He's got like the nature of God, the nature of man. He's just got one will. And that means that he and the Father have separate wills. Now that helps account for things like, you know, why in Acts he says, uh, the, the, dis the disciples say, you know, well now is the time for you restore the kingdom of Israel. And he says, oh, it's not for you to know the things that the, it's not for us to know the things that that the Father has set by his own authority, in, implying that he doesn't even know. Um, so it helps kind of, maybe it helps under, explain things like that. But the, the problem is that in the West, they wanted to see more unity between the Father and the Son, and they ultimately, you know, kind of thought they were working together. There was, there, there was a oneness there. They thought that the, uh, the East was kind of breaking apart, um, there's all kinds of stuff like, you know, the, the East would confuse Rome of just confusing father and son and having no distinction. The, uh, the West would then in turn accuse the East of like elevating the father to some kind of like monarchical status or something, whereas they're supposed to all be on equal footing. And anyways, it posed a big problem. Okay. Now the next big problem was called the Photian schism and it's based on a guy named Photius. What happened was essentially is that the, uh, emperor in the East, deposed uh, a patriarch by the name of Ignatius, sent him running, and needed someone in authority right away. Photius was a very talented guy, up-and-coming young uh, Christian uh, churchman, but didn't have the credentials to be patriarch. Um, wasn't, didn't, you know, just wasn't suited for it yet in terms of his resume. Nevertheless, the emperor put him there super fast, like ran him through all the hoops, you know, made him like, uh, priest, bishop, cardinal, prefect, and everything else, blah, 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 uh, within a few months or weeks even probably, and then next thing you know, he's patriarch of Constantinople. Well, tons of people were outraged by this. You know, guys who had been waiting for the position for years said, hey, no fair, this guy, you know, this upstart comes in, takes over, yeah, this isn't the way it's supposed to work, and so he gets in, I mean, he gets a lot of, you know, abuse going from all sides, Ultimately, the West even turns on him, and the Pope uh, ends up deposing Photius, who then turns around and excommunicates the Pope. This causes a deep schism between the East and the West. It actually lasts for about four years. There's just no recognition going back and forth. And I guess it's important to say at this point that when we say schism, what we mean is no formal recognition um, going back and forth. And, and that means like essentially like, I'm not even recognizing that you're my brother in Christ. You're not even on the list of official, you know, members of the body of Christ. So it's a pretty serious thing for the schism to happen. These two, uh, two aspects or two sections of the church looking at one another saying, nope, not going to share even the Lord's table with you, not going to share communion with you. 
The third thing is that we have the uh, filioque controversy, which I mentioned to you earlier. So here we have the monothelite means two distinct wills. You've got father will, you've got son will, okay? If you're, if you're, and that's the east, okay? Um, but if you're in the west, you say, no, that's not right. The son shares all things in common with the father. He, they have a joint will. That means that when they send the Holy Spirit, okay, when he, when the Holy Spirit proceeds from Father, he also proceeds from the Son. So if you ever say the Nicene Creed in church, you'll notice there's this little clause that says, um, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, if there's any Orthodox folk in your congregation, when that happens, they will close their mouths and they will not say that part uh, because they do not believe that part should be said. That part was, as a fact, added later in history. So you can make up of that what you will. Some people say, that in and of itself is reason not to say it, regardless of what you think about the actual procession of the Spirit. Well, in 1014, this controversy, which had been brewing for a long time, like I said, starts back in the Monothelite controversy in the 7th century. Here we are 300 some odd years later, it's still going on. But in 1014, importantly, Henry II, that is father of the Henry we're talking about, uh, Henry II orders that the uh, clause and the son, that is filioque, you see where the, the Latin comes from, gets added to a mass and it's recited in uh, Rome. Now that right there was a big deal for the East. Now there was like this official uh, tension between the two sides and it was brewing, just waiting for the right thing. Well, remarkably, Okay, something happens that looks like it, during Leo's day. Now we're back, fast forward with me a little bit, it's like 40 years to Leo and uh, Henry III. Something happens that makes it look like there's going to be some unity. I mean, and it has to do with Vikings again. <laughs> Not Vikings like we used to think with long beards and horns coming out of their helmets, but these are Normans, guys from the shores of Normandy, which is in France. Lots of folks missed that. Normans come from Normandy in France. William the Conqueror was a Norman. It's called the Normandy Invasion. Anyway, okay. Um, it's called the Norman Invasion. Never the Norman. Point is, a bunch of those Normans actually made their way to southern Italy. As you know, southern Italy is sort of a weak spot. It's really secure, not like a lot of the places inland in Europe. Well, these... Uh, Norman knights come invade southern Italy, and this gets the attention of three important people: uh, Emperor Constantine the Ninth in the east. Okay, so that's the secular power in the east. Pope Leo the Ninth and Henry the Third. Why? Because all of them have got you know vacation villas down there, and you know monasteries and palaces and, and everything. And they're watching these Normans come busting up to the shores of Italy, and they're thinking, "Oh gosh, this is going to cost me millions of dollars." So they come together and say. Hey, let's let's get something together. I know we've had our troubles in the past, but let's put something together so that we can fight against these Normans and save millions of our own dollars. And so um, they get together, and the three of them get together. Now I'm just noticed that right quick. The three of them we're talking about Leo, uh, Henry III, and Constantine the Ninth. And this is their agreement. Roman churches are going to gain possession of all the Greek churches that are in South Italy. That's a big deal for the Greeks to give, right? Because they're they're giving up some churches there. Because it, I didn't. this is interesting, I didn't realize this, but whether you were in the East or in the West, if you're in Italy or you're in Constantinople, you can actually find churches that are worshiping in the Roman style or in the Eastern style. And this is, you know, a thousand years ago. Anyway, so... Uh, Rome says, you know, first thing is you got to give us all these churches. You got a few little holdout Greek Orthodox churches hanging out in southern Italy. We want those. Uh, Michael says, uh, I'm sorry, Constantine says, all right, that sounds good. Now, notice that Patriarch Michael is not part of this conversation because he probably did not think that was a great idea. Secondly, the Roman church would then provide protection of all Greek possessions belonging to the emperor in the east. They would protect them from the Norman knights, and Leo would lead the charge, okay? And the last thing that the, the West wanted was for uh, the emperor to go to Patriarch Michael in the East and say, hey, how about just like sending a letter to Pope Leo IX? And if he did this, it would be a way of like recognizing that Leo was really the Pope, that he was a Christian, 
that he was a brother, you know, and it would essentially kind of officially heal the schism. Because see, Constantinople had not been sending these kinds of letters to Rome for decades. Uh, really ever since Filioque kind of broke out, maybe even back since Photius. The point is like, they they didn't send each other these correspondence, which is their way of saying, I'm not sure you're really in. You know, I'm not sure you're really one of us. And so, um, you know, Henry and Leo wanted to get this kind of letter from the patriarch because it would sort of heal this division. Well, they set this agreement together. Leo, he's in. Henry's in. The emperor's in. Michael was not in. Michael was not in at all. This guy's name is Michael Carolarius. He was patriarch of Constantinople at the time, and he would he stood against this every fiber of his being. Okay, and said no way. Um, not only so, but he sends like letters reprimanding Leo for his beliefs. He, you know, and it's just ugly. And so he's not helping. He's not cooperating with the secular branch of government at all. Then something pretty remarkable happens. Leo gets captured. Now Leo was taking up the sword, leading men into battle as his pope. This is such an odd thing, and many people see this as really his downfall. But he goes in, and the Normans, who are Catholics, they capture him. So it's like the Normans have captured their own pope. So they put him in this like super nice prison, you know, home confinement. And now Constantine in the east is freaking out because he's the emperor and he's about to lose all his property. These Normans he's going to lose millions of dollars in property. Um, and so he goes back to Michael Carolarius, the patriarch, and says, darn it, you better go talk to Leo. You better do something. Uh, you better heal this divide because things are getting ugly and we need to work together. And so they arrange to have another meeting. Now, Leo obviously can't go, so he sends somebody, a guy named Cardinal Humbert, H-U-M-B-E-R-T. Um, we actually have an official portrait of this guy. Cardinal Humbert looks like this. Right-hand man to Leo and devoted, yes, but also known for uh, being sort of a firebrand, really zealous, and could kind of fly off the handle sometimes. And he goes down there. And while he's down there, Leo bites the dust. 1054, Leo dies. So why he, he's so here's Humbert. He's talking with Michael, who does not want to play nice. And he's trying to convince them all to kind of like come together and recognize Rome. What Humbert doesn't want to be doing this. Humbert hates the fact that he's having to play, you know, diplomat to Michael Carolarius. Because he thinks Michael Carolarius is being arrogant. He thinks Rome is the mother church. You gotta see this. The guys like Humbert think the Roman church is the supreme authority. They think it's the number one church over all of them. And to be going and negotiating with a guy like Carolarius in Constantinople is just insulting to Humbert. Well, now Leo dies. And then Michael Carolarius, patriarch in Constantinople, comes to Humbert and says, I don't even know. I'm not even sure you're legit anymore because... You know, your Pope just died, so maybe you should go back home and kind of rework things and come back to me when you've got some official authority. Well, oh my gosh, this outraged Cardinal Humbert immensely, uh, and so he went and packed his bags, but not before he wrote down an official excommunication document, took it in to Hagia Sophia, put it right there on the altar for everybody to see, and marched out of that cathedral and headed back home to Rome. And that begins the official schism. Now, from that point on, for several hundred years, folks in the East did not recognize the Christianity or the validity of leadership of folks in the West, and vice versa. And there is a major divide, huge church split, and not just because they were playing the wrong kind of music anymore. Uh, but what I hope you see in all this is that it has deep roots in both theological trouble and also in personality conflict and in politics and power and money. It, 
it's not simplified down to one thing. It, it's many different causes all coming together. And this is just the breaking point. So 1054, is it a momentous year? Yes, momentous year. I mean, one of the greatest popes in history dies. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, it's just kind of like the tail end of a very long string of dominoes that have been falling for a long time. So, you know, just to keep all of that in mind, that, you know, had another person besides Humbert been down there, would there even be a 1054 on your timeline? Who knows? Probably not. And this guy was this guy was a hothead. So, uh, I mean, just look at this picture. He's a hothead. Anyway, well, after that, there were actually successive attempts to um, heal the divide, attempts at reconciliation, and they're still going on today, so keep that in mind. Um, both times, 1274 and 1438, there was a council he held a little bit on the western side there. The first one was at Lyon in France, the second one in Florence. Both times, the east sends delegates. The delegates go. They negotiate with the west, and they talk it out. They come up with an agreement, and the delegates go home. And they go home, and every time they go home, the bishops and priests that are residing back in Byzantium just refuse to accept the agreement. I mean, you can imagine how maddening that would be. And the one in 1438 actually took them several years to negotiate. I mean, they were up there for a long time. When they come back home, same thing happens. Bishops are like, no way, we're not going to buy this. We're not jumping in. So no matter, even when they try to reconcile, reconcile it seems to be impossible. And just to kind of put a final note on this, um, the emperor um, in 1453 was a guy named uh, Constantine the 11th, and uh, on the day that the Turks would overrun Constantinople and capture the city, and eventually turn Hagia Sophia into a mosque, on the very day, Constantine the 11th held a worship service in the morning and ordered all Christians from east, from west, from whatever, to come into Hagia Sophia and celebrate the Mass together before they all went out and made their last stand against the Turks. And he did it, and they all came in there together, this beautiful service of unity, and then he went out and he died fighting against the Turks in 1453, which is the fall of Constantinople, the end of the eastern branch of the Roman Empire, if you want to think of it that way. Last to say is, again, here is Francis sitting with uh, that patriarch from Constantinople again, or today Istanbul, the Greek Orthodox patriarch. Uh, they are still working at it. They still talk in. They're still uh, doing things like getting photographed in public. And all of this is, of course, slow, but hopefully steady. We'll see. Uh, attempt to heal the schism. Well, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this slideshow. And I uh, hope it brings up good memories for those of you who uh, killed this test when you were in lower school. Uh, now you're just going to get started on Bernard of Clairvaux, which I also hope you enjoy. Uh, this is one of those rare moments when, as a student, you get to enjoy um, kind of being encouraged in your faith while you are learning something new. So get to it. I'll hopefully see you tomorrow. We'll just have to see how little Charlie fares this evening. Bye now.